What is Porn Studies? Um, porn Studies is an academic discipline. Um, porn Studies is about uh, a conversation with, across a group of scholars across Europe and across the world uh, to start an academic conversation that is about talking about porn, porn in a meaningful way and to think about how we can theorise pornography, um, how we can move away from the kind of uh, popular debates that um, dominate popular understanding of what pornography is. So it's, it's about moving away from having a, uh, a debate that is about porn is either good or bad. Porn is um, about sexual liberation and sexual freedom, or it's about uh, the abuse and oppression of women. So really, what Porn Studies is, is about expanding the debate, expanding um, and developing a language to talk meaningfully about an incredibly um, important and significant cultural phenomenon uh, that tends to, or historically has, got, has tended to be written about, thought about and spoken about in very simple black and white terms. Why is it important to study porn? Scholarship, you know, hu human uh, endeavour in, in the academic terrain is about um, an expanded understanding of the human experience. And um, sexuality is at the heart of the, exp uh, the human experience. So thinking about cultural expressions of sexuality I think is a really important thing to do. I think it's still the case, and it has historically very often been the case, that in the West at least, we've had a very limited vocabulary to talk about sexuality, sexual representations, sex itself. Um, and that has meant that the quality of debates, the quality of understanding of sexual expression has tended to be quite limited. Uh, so we have a, a kind of a, a paradoxical or peculiar situation where um, sex and sexuality is, we often think, is core to who we are as human beings, and yet cultural expressions of this uh, set of activities and practices that, that are core to who we are as human, uh, human beings um, are framed in really simplistic and reductive terms. So for us as porn scholars, it's really important to develop a vocabulary to talk in a meaningful way. And hopefully what results from that is a wider debate that is thinking about human sexuality and cultural expressions of human sexuality in more... Um, open, more reflective, more questioning and critical ways, but ways that are not framed by good, bad, evil, not, you know, and so on. Because we have such a limited vocabulary in the Western world to talk about and think about sex, the minute you start talking about anything to do with sex, sex and sexuality, you're always going to be encountering people who feel intimidated, want to ask you a lot of questions that are about the kind of questions they have within themselves, about the kinds of material that you want to talk about. You have to accept that, this, um, that these are sensitive subjects for people because they feel like they're impinging on other people's um, senses of themselves as sexual beings. But that isn't a reason to stop doing this kind of work. In actual fact, I think that's the reason to carry on doing this kind of work because it is important for us to understand sex and sexuality and one of the routes to understanding it is the way in which um, we, we, we manifest that through cultural expressions of what sex looks like, what it is to be sexually desirable, um, how to conduct 
yourself in a sexual situation. You know, so many people learn how to have sex through popular cultural expressions of sexual conduct, and that's what porn is about. What about the recognition of the academic field? The field itself has taken um, a long time to develop. Um, and that's part, partly to do with the fact that the nature of the material that we choose to analyse um, and that we choose to study and write about um, has often caused embarrassment to people who um, occupy positions of power in the university sector. Um, and the picture is not a uniform picture across Europe or across the rest of the Western world. Um, now, I, was, I, I work in the UK, um, and I started writing, studying and thinking about porn in the, the, the middle to late 1990s, and I became a PhD student, a funded PhD student by the, uh, what used to be called the Arts and Humanities Research Board in the UK, and I was a funded research student um, given a scholarship and a full, uh, you know, a, a, my fees were paid at a stipend to study gay pornography. Um, and I was supported by my university, even though at the higher levels of my university there were some concerns about whether this was um, an ethical project. There were some concerns about whether this was the kind of project that would bring the university into disrepute. Um, but even though those, those kind of conversations were taking place in the mid to late 1990s about my research projects, I continued to be supported. And my experience in actual fact of uh, British academia is that although, you know, from time to time, even now from time to time, people will um, look at me quizzically when they know that I've written a book about gay pornography or will ask questions about why why would you want to do that research there isn't um, a, a level of outright prejudice towards this this work I, I, I guess if I'd have chosen a different route and decided to talk about um, representations of eroticism in fine art maybe that would have been seen as more legitimate inevitably because because I I and my, my colleagues are writing about popular culture, there will always be a tension between um, academics who, who think about, write about and theorise of, um, objects of study that are, are considered legitimate culture or fine art or you know, high quality materials versus people who write about popular culture. How did you start doing porn studies? It's kind of a, 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 a longish story. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a gay man. I um, went to... The first time I went to um, America was uh, in the very early 1990s. And I went to New York in the very early 1990s. This was just at the point that I was about to re-enter um, education. This was just at the point I was about to become an undergraduate student. I went back to university as a mature student. Um, so I went to New York for the first time. And this was New York um, and a gay scene in New York that was decimated by the AIDS pandemic. Um, I came from a very small provincial city in England where there was a very small gay scene and I was visiting this huge metropolis with an enormous gay scene and I became very, very conscious that my experience of gay life and how um, gay men chose to express themselves and communicate themselves as sexual beings was very different to the kind of activities, the way people looked, the way people uh, presented themselves that I was seeing in New York at that time. And that raised loads of questions for me. 
Um, lo lots of questions, really. Um, and it stuck with me. And I came back from New York thinking about um, this very sexualized, macho, eroticized iconography that large numbers of people in the, in, in the, uh, the, the clubs in, and, and gay bars in New York, um, these were the ways that people were choosing to um, dress and present themselves on the gay scene. And I, re I really found myself thinking, what is this about? Where is this... Uh, how is this iconography so pervasive in this culture at this moment in time? And how can this be so different to the experience of a provincial British city? Uh, the way people looked, the way people represented themselves in act or presented themselves in actual fact was really different to, the, uh, to what the, the, the London gay scene looked like at that time as well, as a matter of fact. So I started to think about what was this um, and how it made me feel myself, how it made me feel about my own appearance and my own body. I came back from New York thinking I really need to go to the gym, for example, and at, uh, how old would I have been at that time? 24, 25? The idea of going to a gym had never even entered my consciousness. Suddenly I became body conscious. Um, so it was a whole set of those things that kind of tease me, that kind of, you know, like when you get a little uh, germ of an idea and it kind of gets stuck in here somewhere and you're constantly thinking about it. So it stuck with me for such a long time. And then when I became a student, um, and I was moving towards having to write an undergraduate dissertation, I suddenly decided, oh, this is the thing to think about. How gay men, um, what, what sexy looks like for gay men. Um, and as a media uh, student, the route to me writing about what sexy looks like was to look at gay porn. And when I started doing that, and read around the subjects and tried to reach out and make contact with the very few scholars who'd written about this, um, I quite quickly realised that there was a lot of work here that could be done. Um, I was very lucky very early on as an undergraduate, uh, Richard Dyer uh, lived very close to me in Birmingham and I got the opportunity to interview Richard as um, as an undergraduate uh, um, student writing my dissertation and student uh, and, and, and Richard was very encouraging and, and Richard said yes there, there is still scope to write stuff you should think about continuing this work so then when I became a master's student I wrote uh, um, a bigger thesis on gay pornography and on, on, on the back of that so I uh, I applied to become a PhD student at a time when, um, although I was supported, it was a very, very um, exotic choice to decide to uh, write about gay porn in order to gain a PhD. It was a very strange thing to do indeed. So lots of people, although they encouraged me, kind of thought, why? Why would you be doing this? So that, that, that was my route into it, and I've carried on since. I've carried on because nobody's stopped me. <laughs>